is the Campbell, Ohio steel mill of the Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company. Many of the steel workers at the Campbell Works are third generation employees. On September 19, 1977, Sheet and Tube, now a subsidiary of the Likes Corporation, announced that it was closing down most of its Campbell plant. It's hard to believe this is happening. After working here for so many years, it's hard to believe that we're put out on the street and don't know what we're going to do. 5,000 steel workers, many of them skilled veterans of 20 to 30 years, lost their jobs. In Youngstown and nearby Campbell, they have a name for the day disaster struck. They call it Black Monday. But backed by a determined coalition of their religious leaders, they are fighting it. I want a job. I don't want benefits. They could take the benefits right now. I don't want them. I'd rather have a job. I think we all ought to face the fact that here's a hell of a problem. We're all involved, and how can we really solve it? It would be very easy to wait for George or for Uncle Sam or some angel from somewhere to do it. Many of our people don't want to move out. They have hope and they have faith. And they're ready to put their money where their mouth is. The church cannot lead people to God with empty bellies. If you read the Constitution, which I haven't done in years, but what little I remember for it, there's two basic things that the federal government is charged to do. One of them with is see to the common good of all men, and the other is to take care of national defense. Now, they've done one extremely well. Their goal is to take over the Campbell Works and run it themselves. If they succeed, it will be the largest worker community-owned enterprise in the United States. The Youngstown story, the story of a community facing economic disaster and fighting it, has attracted national attention and deep interest here in Washington. It has dramatized the problems of the steel industry, which is basic to the continued economic growth and security of the United States. It has also raised profound questions about the role and responsibilities of giant corporations in the United States. There have been Black Mondays by the score in recent years, particularly in the crisis-ridden steel industry, as industry and capital have moved in a massive exodus from the traditional industrial centers of the Northeast and Midwest. There is nothing new about plant shutdowns or corporate decisions to abandon workers and communities in search of greener and more profitable pastures, but there is something new something very new and therefore of national importance in the response of Youngstown to the crisis it faces. Youngstown is a town which is refusing to die. In that refusal to die and in the effort to overcome the social and human consequences that flow from massive unemployment, the people of Youngstown are posing sharp and difficult questions that go to the heart of the American way of doing business. The primary question that the people of Youngstown are asking through their political, church, and community leaders is, what is the responsibility of a corporation to the community where its plants are located? In the months since Black Monday, United States Steel has also announced that it will let its mills in Youngstown run down, eventually eliminating 5,000 jobs. General Fireproofing, a major steel user, is leaving. General Motors' Packard Electric in nearby Warren laid off more than a thousand workers. And many local leaders believe the Likes Corporation, the New Orleans-based conglomerate that bought out Youngstown Sheet and Tube in 1969, is likely to abandon its remaining Youngstown steel facilities if a proposed merger with the LTV Corporation, another steel-owning conglomerate, is approved. Many of Youngstown's leaders believe one of the root causes of Black Monday to be absentee ownership. The mayor of Youngstown, J. Philip Richley, took office January 1st of this year in a crisis-ridden atmosphere. Had the sheet and tube ownership remained local, I think it's the feeling of a great many people that perhaps it would still be alive and economically viable today. William A. Sullivan, Jr., economist. So sure, it's different when the guy's making the decision is in New Orleans and not in Youngstown because he doesn't have to go out to dinner and talk to his friends and his banker and, you know, his fellow industrialists about the decision he just made. Bill Svera, president of Local 1418, United Steelworkers of America. I think with, uh, when Likes came in here, I believe it was around seven or eight years ago, a lot of people at that time said, well, there goes the company, and uh, nobody paid too much attention. But the truth of the matter is, I feel that Likes just came right out and actually raped us. When they took over the place, uh, 
eight years ago. They came in with the intention of milking it dry. When Likes acquired the Youngstown Sheet and Tube, they added substantially to the debt structure because they issued stock and debt instruments in the new corporation to pay for it. And that took a lot of available capital away from them. That could well be considered by some as milking. Others may see that as sound uh, business economics. A lot of the milk has been skimmed off the top, and as a result, we've been left with a deteriorating facility. Likes just more or less took the cream off the crop and just took the money out and ran. ABC News, on three occasions, invited the Likes Corporation to participate in this program. The corporation declined. To explore some of the basic economic problems that led up to Black Monday, we talked with William A. Sullivan, Jr. of Niles, Ohio. I think the basic problem is that the industry has begun to run out of money, and the imports have driven down the price of steel to a point that last year many companies lost money literally on every ton of steel they sold. We asked also why steelmakers in the area were at a competitive disadvantage. Part of it's institutional. We're an inland steel location. We move our ore in from the Great Lakes by rail, and because of the way we run our railroads in this country, an ore train can go over five different railroad properties, and each time it does, it changes not only crews, but also engines. The average speed of an ore train is less than one mile an hour. There's nothing wrong with the trains, the track, or anything else. It's just the way we run them. Another part of the problem here is that our industry grew up like Topsy. Steel was once a family industry. And it grew up that way, and small companies combined, and if the plants are not laid out logically. Our furnaces are not only old, they're also very small. All of those things are beginning to catch up with us. We asked Mr. Sullivan what he saw as the immediate future of steel in the Mahoning Valley. Tenuous. We have another 10,000 jobs hanging by a thread. What will happen to the overall economy depends, to a very large extent, on how well we keep our nerve. The city of Campbell, it appears, will be essentially bankrupt, and that will happen uh, about mid-July. Right now, the strength of this valley is in the steel worker. He's an extraordinarily resilient guy with a lot of common sense. He's not prone to panic. There's no panic in the streets in Campbell or anyplace else that I've seen thus far. If there is no panic in the streets of Campbell, one reason may be that the steel workers here have not yet felt the full economic impact of unemployment. Some are receiving a package of benefits which comes close to what they were earning when they were working. This is the union hall of Local 1418, one of the locals hit hardest by the shutdown of the Campbell Works. Since Black Monday, one of every four members has lost his job permanently. In addition to unemployment insurance, Steel workers are eligible for TRA payments, federal funds provided for workers who have lost their jobs as a result of foreign competition. Most are also eligible for subsidies, so-called subs, which flow from union management contracts. But both TRA and subs payments are running out. The limit on unemployment insurance is 52 weeks, and anxiety is mounting. I have 18 years in there, 37 years old. I can't get anything. After a year from now, I'm finished. And I'm remaining calm. But nothing is being done. And I can only remain calm for maybe 10 more months. But uh, once the benefits run out, who's going to pick up my bills? This winter, for the first time in 75 years, the snow held on the roofs of the closed down sections of the Campbell Works. The intense heat of steel making was gone. The jobs were gone. And in Campbell, where the mill for three quarters of a century had been the heart of community life, something else was gone. First day I started, I was 15 and a half years old. I come up and worked in a hospital, uh, worked in the uh, coupling shop. I come up to the ramp, and my dad, he's dead, he died now, the rest in peace. But um, my dad worked 33 years, yeah, 33 years. My dad was working right on a furnace. When I seen that, I wanted to run out of there, and I was so scared I wanted to run out of there, but I finally went there and worked. My last day, I had the opportunity to ride out, but I walked out, and I was the slowest, the longest walk I ever had across that bridge. I put in 34 good years, and I could be proud of mine for 34 years, but that was the saddest moment I ever had when I came home. And would you say a man 
my age without a tear in his eye? Yes, I did have a tear in my eye. Because I look back, I said, I'll never see it again. We can't measure the dev devastating effect on the community morale. That's difficult to measure. We're talking about the loss of about $80 million a year in wages. We're talking about almost $5 million a year in real estate taxes, which basically is a support system for our education in this area. We can't measure the increase in the divorce rates, the separation rates in families, the number of school dropouts because of the inability to meet college tuition. The social impact is fantastic. Many communities facing the problems Mayor Richley describes have concentrated on strengthening social and family services. In this regard, Youngstown is different. Since Black Monday, its basic energies have been directed towards the basic question, jobs. The first concerted action following Black Monday came from neither political nor community leaders. It came from an unlikely source, the church. One week after the Likes Corporation shut down the Campbell plant, the bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown, the Most Reverend James W. Malone, and the bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Ohio, the Right Reverend John H. Burt, convened other local religious leaders for a discussion of the underlying nature of the disastrous development. That have been laid off. From these discussions, there emerged an ecumenical coalition of more than 200 Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, and Orthodox clergymen. The coalition's executive committee reflects the diversity of faiths represented. Bishops Malone and Burt, Bishop James S. Thomas of the East Ohio Conference of the United Methodist Church, Rabbi Sidney Berkowitz, spiritual leader of Youngstown's Rodef Sholem Temple, Reverend John Sherrick of Youngstown's Eastminster Presbytery. Under this leadership, the ecumenical coalition has become the cornerstone of the effort for recovery in the Mahoning Valley. It has gone far beyond statements of concern. It has made an unprecedented entry by the church into economic areas. One of the first actions taken was the publication of a pastoral letter in all churches and synagogues and in the print media outlining the moral and ethical issues raised by the precipitate shutdown of the Campbell works of Youngstown Sheet and Tube. The pastoral letter said, in part, quote, we believe that industrial investment decisions ought to take into account the needs and desires of employees and the community at large. In its refusal to invest in new equipment or necessary maintenance, the Likes Corporation failed to do this. Human beings and community life are higher values than corporate profits." End quote. We asked Father Edward Stanton, coordinator of the Ecumenical Coalition, if in his view, the Likes Corporation was solely responsible for the Youngstown crisis. There's been a, a fight between big government and big steel, and we have 5,000 casualties in Camel, Ohio. I think that those things, plus many other factors, uh, are all part of it. it. We just can't say it was bad management or anything like that on the part of Likes. I think that was a part of it. But I think the whole steel picture uh, is part of the, the same ills of the other steel companies, only we had them worse. There's no such thing as a morally indifferent act. And so any action, especially one that hurts 5,000 people, and that's 5,000 immediately, their families, the ripple effect could be a lot more than that. Anything that affects 5,000 people adversely, we have to question the morality of them. That's where we started. Pastorally, we heard 5,000 guys saying, we want our jobs back. In an effort to get 5,000 jobs back, the Ecumenical Coalition late last year proposed a direct, if difficult, solution. The coalition reasoned that if no one else would reopen the Campbell Works of Youngstown Sheet and Tube, then the workers and the community should do it themselves. In early November, the coalition joined in funding a preliminary feasibility study. Uh, we cooperated with the Ecumenical Coalition on the first 30-day study on the feasibility. Our study indicated that the entrance fee to get back into operation is about $125 million. Can the worker community ownership come up with four to $500 million over five or six years? I don't know. Despite those figures, there was sufficient encouragement in the first study to justify a fuller study of the feasibility of a worker community takeover of Youngstown Sheet and Tube's Campbell plant. The Ecumenical Coalition pressed forward in its consultations and its efforts here in Washington. 
On December 30th, just three and a half months after Black Monday, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, signed a contract with the National Center for Economic Alternatives, providing $300,000 for the further exploration and development of a plan for worker community ownership. HUD Undersecretary Jay Janis comments on the importance of that step. Well, I say that simply put, the thing that we'd like to accomplish is that we'd like Youngstown to be a showcase, a showcase of, of self-help and a showcase of community involvement that somehow can be an example for the rest of the nation. Is this going to end up really just being a kind of a federal bailout? Oh, no. I, I think bailout is the last word that I would use. Uh, that is, I, in my judgment, antithetical to the entire approach here. This is a community that wants to chart and plan its own future. It wants to take matters into its own hands and find a way to deal what it, with what is a devastating blow to its economy. And it wants to do so by exploring a variety of possibilities. And the key is, how can the federal government, using what resources we have, help local communities who are interested in self-help and local community development to, to do the job? This is the first presentation uh, by the National Center for Economic Alternatives to this group. And, uh, represent While the feasibility report and action plan goes forward, the early initiative of the Ecumenical Coalition has helped to stimulate other efforts in Youngstown. If a feasible plan for a community worker ownership of the Campbell Works can be developed, it will not be the clergy which will implement it. It will be implemented by the Mahoning Valley Economic Development Committee, a group of prominent citizens from all sections of the community, chaired by Mayor Richley. Uh, we'd be happy to hear your report. We are here to deepen the... Uh, Two months ago, the committee met in Youngstown City Council Chamber. As the mayor just... Uh, Reporting was Mr. Jeff Foe, a co-director of the National Center for Economic Alternatives. That in order to finance and to put back the Campbell Works, federal money is going to be needed. We think you need three things to get that federal money. One is the feasibility of the facility has to be proven. Secondly, there has to be a reason for putting what will be extraordinary investment by federal standards into Youngstown. And thirdly, there has to be the will, the demonstrated will and concern of the people of Youngstown to make it happen. To demonstrate the will of the people of Youngstown, in mid-February of this year, the Ecumenical Coalition launched a Save Our Valley campaign. At a press conference in Youngstown's Catholic Diocese, Episcopal Bishop John H. Burt outlined the reasons for the newest move in the fight against Black Monday. We propose to every citizen in the valley that the American dream be put to work in a fresh way. That dream we believe is about freedom from want, it is about self-help, it is about independence, it is about community leadership, it is about cooperation, it is about viable democracy. If no one else can bail out the Mahoning Valley with its closed steel mills, we believe we have no recourse except to begin the process right here, ourselves. The campaign is asking individuals and groups to show support of the worker community ownership plan by opening Save Our Valley accounts in local savings institutions. Every bank in the valley is cooperating in this demonstration of local determination. The Save Our Valley accounts are seen as a signal to Washington that the valley's citizens are in earnest about the takeover of the Campbell plant. I have seen him in the watchhouse of a hundred circling camps. On February 16th, the Ecumenical Coalition's Save Our Valley campaign moved into high gear with a community rally in the Boardman United Methodist Church. The opening hymn was sung by the choir of the Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company. It's ethically unacceptable, I believe, for a large corporation to take away a people's livelihood without the people participating in the decision that led 
to the withdrawal. We have asked whether the Camel Works could be reopened as a viable, economically sound steel plant. And we've asked what the price of such viability might be. That's the feasibility question. Number two, we've also asked whether some outside investors and entrepreneurs might be interested in reopening the Seaton 2 plant. This is the private investor question. But in the absence of such investors, we have asked and we are asking tonight whether this community, all of its citizens, its skilled steel workers and their families, might create a new kind, a new form of community-owned and operated steel plant. We're aware that what we're doing is an unusual move for our day ministers to be spokesmen in the concerns that we're spokesmen for tonight. But we feel that that unusual action on our part will focus attention on our valley. You will be enabled to say to federal leadership, we in the valley are doing our part. And because we're doing our part, we're a different valley. Because we are different, we expect to be treated differently. And we're hoping that what we're proposing can come true because federal dollars will be attracted to a valley where people stand together and with a real sense of security make a testimony and a witness of faith. In mid-March, we talked with Dr. Gar Alperovitz, co-director of the National Center for Economic Alternatives, the agency working on the Youngstown Feasibility Study. Why should a worker community-owned plant succeed when likes couldn't? Well, the, there are two parts to the problem. Uh, the evidence really is that, in many ways, this company was badly mined or milked, very little reinvestment in the company, and when the downswing in the steel cycle came, there just wasn't enough there at all. Uh, many people have charged mismanagement. But on the plus side, uh, we know from the evidence of worker-owned industries around this country and elsewhere in the world, very regularly, when people have a, a real stake in what they're doing, productivity goes up, performance goes up, uh, 15, 25, even 30 percent increases in productivity have been recorded in uh, similar industries. Uh, the other part of it is uh, people in this town uh, care in a fundamental and direct way about the fate of that industry. It is the heart of that local economy. And from their point of view, uh, a 5, 6, 7, 8 percent profit uh, would be plenty good and very solid because of the other effects in the community. Now, giant conglomerate in this country uh, typically really wants 15, 18 percent profit and they if they don't get that, they're ready to go on someplace else. So uh, those are really two of the major reasons why we think we've got a good chance here. Are you hopeful that this feasibility study will prove a model for situations elsewhere? Well, it's, it seems to me that one of the, the overwhelming conclusions of anyone who, who studied the economy is that this decade and this final quarter of the century we're in is, is very different from the past period. Uh, well, there's going to be no return to normalcy. Uh, if it's not Youngstown, people sense it may be their own community next. Uh, Youngstown is a dramatic, sharp, sudden heart attack. But throughout the Upper Northeast, the Midwest, many parts of the country, this, this cancer of jobs disappearing out from under communities, that's something people understand very directly. And the idea of coming up with a positive response, starting in the local community, asking for help to do productive work, and the federal money that's going to go into Youngstown is going to go in one way or another, either as welfare payments or as some assistance to people who want to get on with productive work. And that kind of response is important in a period where we really can't expect a normal uh, return to some sort of upbeat economy. We're in for difficult times, I think. Early this month, the National Center for Economic Alternatives released its preliminary findings. The highlights? A worker community takeover is technically and economically feasible. Needed to start up, 145 to 185 million dollars. The model of ownership proposed includes workers, community and church groups, plus private investment. Needed from these sources, 52 million dollars over two to five years. Federal long-term loan guarantees to private lenders are required. Needed, 250 to 500 million dollars over six years. At a conservative projection of the basic commercial market, the reopened plant will do slightly better than break even. In line with the president's recently announced urban policy, the study reports if the government directed only 2 to 6 percent of what it now procures in steel to the Campbell plant, economic success of the plant would be assured. 
This, like loan guarantees, could be provided by executive order, the stroke of a pen, at any time. Finally, the study notes, since the government will purchase these goods anyway, and since what is required is loan guarantees to private lenders rather than direct taxpayer expenditures, the additional cost to government of reopening the plant would be virtually nothing. The cost of doing nothing, of not reopening the plant, in unemployment and social welfare programs, a minimum of $75 million. What is happening in Youngstown is of national importance, not only because workers, community leaders, church groups, and government are trying to reopen an aging steel mill, but because they're striving to create a model for recovery that could have a profound effect on other depressed industrial centers. Perhaps more significantly, the fight against Black Monday is a struggle to find a new approach within the American economy that reconciles human needs and corporate needs. Whether or not the fight against Black Monday can be won remains to be seen. But in the challenge, Youngstown's ecumenical coalition has opened a vast new area of social action for the church. In the effort to reorganize the traditional relationships between gigantic institutions and individual citizens, they are trailblazing a way for every segment of our society in the task of reinvigorating the American ideals of progress and equality of opportunity.